Amen. Praise the Lord. Just one other quick announcement that I wanted sh- I wanted to share with you. Um, we are, we aren't live streaming uh, the service uh, this morning. We're just going to be recording the message part of the service. We had some trouble last week with the live stream, and one of the things that I'll tell you is that um, for a church our size doing digital anything, well, for a church any size doing digital anything is a challenge. Let's be honest. <laughs> But one of the things that happens within um, using digital is that there's multiple layers of how you can do digital, right? Uh, Jody and I do a podcast, although we're way behind, we're overdue. Um, You just record it in a controlled environment. You can edit it, get it the way that you want to, and post it. Uh, Live stream is just kind of like running outside in your underwear to a certain extent. (laughs) You don't know what's going to happen. Anything's possible. The other thing is that um, when you live stream on Facebook, which is what we normally do, the um, quality of that recording, they have some say over that, and they have to shrink it and diminish it. And all that to say, um, we're just going to record the the message part of the service this morning. So those of you who are watching after the fact, uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask me after the service, but Um, In some ways, this makes it a little bit easier. (laughs) Not in a lot of ways, actually. Um, But if you have a Bible this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Acts. Acts 17 and 18, kind of those two chapters, uh, is where we're going to be this morning and um, maybe beyond this morning. So this past week, um, as you're turning there, you can just keep it open on your lap. Uh, I had the opportunity to attend not one but two different pastors' meetings um, that were both very well attended, actually, and um, had a lot of discussion about what's happening in our culture today, both politically and uh, with the health crisis and all of those sort of things. And it was a very good discussion, actually. Um, and the, the first meeting I was a part of, the pastor, the topic was politics in the church and what different pastors may or may not be doing uh, leading up to the election. And it was a very good discussion. And um, for the most part in ministry, uh, I ha- don't, don't tend to say a lot about politics. In fact, in 2008, 12. I think it was actually 2008. Some of you may not know this, but I wrote a blog post. This was on an old blog that we had um, that we don't even use anymore, um, just about the whole political process happening at the time. And I wrote within that blog post that I had concerns that politics could have the tendency to hijack the true mission of the church, which was to preach the gospel. I can't remember exactly what the wording was on that. Um, And a very liberal, progressive website found that quote and put it on their website. And they just took a very small line or two from the whole entire context of the blog post. Now, I don't say that to, to demean them, but I just, it was weird. Like me, Jamie Pripp, I got quoted on someone's website. And the, 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 the quote still exists on that website today. And it was, a, it was a eye-opening experience because that particular website, their main focus is abortion, pro-choice. And I actually reached out to them and said, I, I would like my name. Um, removed. I'd like this quote removed. I never gave you permission to use this quote. There was ways, all sort of extenuating context, extra context that was not included in your quote, and uh, never heard from them, and they never took it down. And so for me, um, I've been wrestling this year probably more than ever just because of how many people are talking about it and the conversations that we're having. Um, All that to say, my big passion about what's happening in culture and in our country today is much more related to worldview. 
than a political process. Because I think ultimately what you're seeing on display politically, uh, and you're probably wondering what this has to do with Acts 17 and 18, you're going to find out because it's very relevant, um, has to do with worldview. Um, there are worldviews world views that are clashing in front of us. And basically, it boils down to a biblical worldview or a not biblical worldview. And so that's really my passion. And um, I have no qualms. I had a, a, a secretary who's gone on to be with the Lord now, um, who I still remember, and this would have been a long time ago, because this was way back in the day in Prior Lake days, you know, she said to me, she said, I could not, will not stand before the Lord and say that I voted for an agenda that kills babies or funds them. Now, she never said, pol you know, political person or anything, but she was emphatic on that. And I was at, we were at her funeral, she passed away this year, and I, I've always thought about that. But again, even the, pol even the abortion topic is a worldview topic. It's our understanding of life and, and the beginning of life. So, all that to say, I don't want to be silent um, right now, and I don't want to necessarily endorse candidates, but I thought that this past week's uh, debate was fascinating. And part of why I think it's fascinating is that, um, unlike the train wreck a couple weeks ago, this one was mu much more um, respectable. But I think it's fascinating because not when, when we switched our kids from just homeschooling to classical conversations, all of them have had to do at least one, but some of the times multiple, debates. And I learned some things about debates, not from watching politics, but from, from watching my kids in classical conversations. And there's rules, and, and there's ways that you lose debates. And, um, and it's sad to me that we've lost the ability to have grown men have a decent, respectable conversation. Um, so we live in a time where, as the church, our voice needs to be heard. And the best way you can do that is by voting. Amen? We live in a very unique country that affords us that opportunity. So, Acts chapter 17. Here's what I want to do for a minute. Is <clears throat> somehow I want to invite you into the wrestling that I do as a pastor of how we are to engage the clash of ideas happening around you. So what I'm going to present to you today is the fact that Paul did it. Okay? Paul didn't build a, a nice little church where he could isolate himself like a monk from the rest of the world. Paul observed what was happening in the, in the culture around him. He observed the conflict of ideas, and he engaged. Amen? So it says this in Acts chapter... 17. I'm going to start reading in verse 16. So they're traveling and, and they come to Athens and it says this in Acts 17, 16. While Paul was waiting for them, uh, meaning some other men to join him, he was deeply troubled by all the idols he saw everywhere in the city. He went to the synagogue to debate the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles and he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. Okay, you need to take note of that. Paul himself didn't just engage in the life of a church. The Bible says, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation, he went into the public square. He wasn't afraid to, to present his worldview. And how many of you know Paul had a very distinct worldview? And one of the things I want to propose to you today is that if you claim to be a follower of Christ, and I don't say that disparagingly, but if you claim to be a follower of Christ, immediately your worldview is in conflict with the world around you. Because ultimately, what we believe boils down to this. God sent his son into the world, born of a virgin, who lived a completely pure and sinless life, died on a cross for us, and rose again from the dead to give us the hope of our salvation. 
Can you understand why that would be in conflict with the world around us? So this idea that somehow the church needs to be more relevant, I say, what do you mean by relevant? <laughs> relevant doesn't mean you dress like, look like, talk like, act like the world. That's not being relevant. Relevant is the world has a sin problem. The gospel has the solution. So I really want you to take note of that. God-fearing Gentiles, he spoke daily in the public square to all who happened to be there. He also had a debate with some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers, okay? He's smarter than me, okay? I'm not going out there to debate philosophers. <laughs> not that I shouldn't, but, but he engaged them. When he told them about Jesus and his resurrection, they said this. Now listen to this. This babbler has picked up some strange ideas, He's pushing some foreign religion, okay? Conflict of worldviews, conflict of ideas. The point I'm really trying to get across to you today is that if you want to be a follower of Jesus, you didn't enter into some sort of passive Christian you know, religion where you just wait for Jesus to come. You, engaged, you entered into a battle. And the battle is a battle of ideas. It's not a physical battle. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We wrestle against the principalities and powers that what? Exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. So when you get, you know, um, j j we watched the debate together and it was very excruciating. Jody doesn't like it. She prayed through the whole thing. She doesn't like conflict. But when you watch what's happening in our culture today, I want you to think about Paul. That's what I want you to take away today. I want you to think about Paul. Paul was involved in hostile debate, hostile conversations about his faith. In fact, they said he's, he has some strange ideas. He's pushing some foreign religion. Then they took him to the council of philosophers. Come and tell us more about this new religion, they said. You are saying some rather startling things. And we want to know what it's all about. Now, Here's the thing. I had one of the pastors at my meeting this week said, you know, I have people that are have a variety of worldviews in my church and there's some topics that they can discuss and it gets very heated. But he, he said I had to tell them the moment that you get offended or you offend someone else, you need to disengage because now you're usurping your higher calling to love and to serve that person. So if you can't get involved in that sort of discussion or dialogue or debate, without getting your feelings hurt or getting emotional, then you need to disengage because now you're going to ruin your witness. So there was something about Paul that was within him that he could, I think, engage in these conversations without uh, hurting his witness. He said, you are saying some, they said, you are saying some rather startling things, and we want to know what it's all, all about. It should be explained that all the Athen Athenians and as well as foreigners in Athens seem to spend all their t time discussing the latest ideas. Does that sound like today? Holy smokes. Part of why, you know, politics has become kind of a, a form of entertainment, let's be honest. Um, they set those debates up in such a way to get people to, riled up and engaged. They're, they're not like, oh, let's have a fair debate, hogwash. <laughs> they want eyeballs on the screen. And so if it's, a, if, if, if it's a train wreck, that's good for ratings. So I don't necessarily mean that when I'm talking about a clash of ideas, but, but there are people who struggle to make sense of the world today. And it's our job to give an account for what we believe. Amen? We should know what we believe. We should know why we believe it. In fact, Lady Bird Johnson said this, the clash of ideas is the sound of freedom. The clash of ideas, we shouldn't be afraid of ideas. We should, we should discuss them and, and, and let them have their say and use history to say, well, how has that worked in the past? Verse 22, so Paul, standing before the council, addressed them as follows. Men of Athens, I notice that you are very religious. Do you think there are people today in our community, our culture, who are religious, but do not have a relationship with the Lord? Absolutely. For as I was walking along, I saw your many altars, 
And one of them had this inscription on it, to an unknown God. So they were confused. Amen? They didn't know who they were worshiping. They didn't know who they were praying to. And Paul says, you have been worshiping him without knowing who he is. And now I wish to tell you about him. So Paul looked, he observed, he saw that the people were religious, they had certain ideas, they had erected certain uh, structures of worship, but ultimately he also recognized and understood they didn't know the true God. And Paul said, I'm here to tell you about him. Verse 24, okay, now we're going to get into clash of ideas. He is the God who made the world and everything in it. Since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't serve his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and he satisfies every need there is. From one man he created all the nations, i.e. races, although it's not technically races, um, throughout the, the whole earth, he decided beforehand which should rise and fall, and he determined their boundaries. By the way, you all know there's one, only one race, the human race, right? Amen. Verse 27, his purpose in all of this was the nations should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as one of your poets says, we are his offspring. And since this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol designed by craftsmen from gold or silver or stone. God overlooked people's former ignorance about these things, but now he commands everyone everywhere to turn away from idols and turn to him. For he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man, who's the man? Jesus. He has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. So Paul has this conversation, but he's going somewhere, right? And where he's going is actually connected to the book of Hebrews, especially in the very beginning part of Hebrews. And that is that in Hebrews chapter 1, what you read is that uh, the writer of Hebrews said that God used to speak in these ways. He would speak through the prophets. He would speak this way. But now, and he, he quantifies this time frame, in these last days, which we are a part of, he has spoken finally, completely, through his Son. I was reading Oswald Chambers this week, and I was blown away by just this last week's reading because uh, one of the things that he really brings about, which I think is so interesting, is that um, we tend to think in terms of sinful acts. The Bible tends to speak of sinful nature. So what, what we have conversations about, you and I, and, and our frailty and our uh, limited knowledge is, is this sinful or is this not sinful? You hear that a lot. Is this sinful or is this not sinful? Well, what Oswald Chambers proposes, and he backs this up with John chapter 3, uh, not verse 16, but verse 19, is that the reason that men fall into judgment, men and women fall into judgment, is not because of their sinful deeds. They fall into judgment because they are born, whether they want to or not, with a sinful nature, and they are without hope. They have a sinful nature. They're by birth disobedient and rebellious to God. They seek after false idols, they, all, all of these sorts of things. They have a sin problem, and the sin problem is their nature. But God, the Bible says, who's rich in mercy, has provided a way of escape, and that was his, the sacrifice of his son. So what Oswald Chambers proposes is that in the book of John, what John argues is that what condemns people is they don't receive 
the remedy. John chapter 3, 16, we love to quote, but in John chapter 3, verse 19, if you want to turn there, let's just look at it together. Might as well, right? John chapter 3, he says this in verse 19. Well, let's just start in, in, we can start in 16 since that's the one we like, right? <laughs> John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Now listen to this. This is fascinating. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but rather to save it. Verse 18. There is no judgment awaiting those who trust him. Hallelujah. There is no judgment awaiting those who trust them. But those who do not trust him have already been judged for not believing in the only son of God. Now listen to this. Verse 19. Their judgment is based on this fact. The light from heaven came into the world but they love the darkness more than the, the light, for their actions were evil. The Bible says that what condemns and ultimately uh, judges people is that they don't believe in Jesus. And why don't they believe in Jesus? Because they don't want to come to the light and have their sins dealt with. They love the darkness. I don't know about you, but if you look at what's happening in the conversation of our culture today, where man is calling good evil and evil good, and you see on open display people not wanting to come to the light, it's very, very apparent that the Bible is 110% relevant <laughs> It's all around us. And, and what Paul is saying is this. What, what, we, what we learn from Paul is this. The Bible is, has the good news. And the good news is that you don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to die separated from Christ. You can have the hope of eternal life by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. But if you refuse, you've placed the judgment on yourself. It's kind of like if you were ever sentenced in the court of the law and the person sentenced you and said, you're guilty unless you take this remedy and we reject the remedy because we don't want to give up our lifestyle. I'm getting ready to, um, to do a class online uh, on on a biblical worldview, and it, what intrigued me about the class was that um, what was proposed in the syllabus, so to speak, is that there's only two religions in the world: oneism or twoism. And uh, I'm very fascinated because the author, what he proposes, is 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 very simple: either you worship God. Or you worship yourself. And boy, isn't that really ultimately the crux of what we're seeing in front of us today? Because if, if God is who he says he is, he has, a, he has demands. He says, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. He says, the, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God through Jesus Christ is his son. Right? Right? But man says what? The, 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 the secularism of our day says, ultimately, who is God? I am God. That's ultimately the two options that you have in front of you today. Either God is God or you are God, and you have to live with the consequences of that. We sometimes forget, I think, that that Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 18, if the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. I, I don't know about you, but that's difficult for me. I, I think many of us have a varying degree of a people pleaser gene. 
And so we don't like the idea that our ideas or our view of the world would clash with someone else's. And yet, that's exactly what we read in the Bible. You see, if you've ever found yourself in an uncomfortable situation because you either had shared your faith and gotten ridiculed, or because you had the opportunity to say something but didn't out of fear of offending, it feels like a no-win situation. And yet, as we read in Acts chapter 17, Paul wasn't afraid. And ultimately, what the day of Pentecost brought to us in Acts chapter 1 is that Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. To what? Be my witnesses. The power that the Holy Spirit gives us is meant to make us a witness of what Jesus said and did. And oh, by the way, not just that, because if you turn back to the book of Acts, and as I said, if you remember, I said, He was on a mission in his explanation. Amen? He was going somewhere. But let's look again at where he was going. At the very end of of the text that that I read in Acts chapter 17, Paul says this about a pastime thing in verse 30. He said, it used to be, that's my version, but I'll read the New Living. He said, God overlooked people's former ignorance about these things, but now, what's the but now? But what, what brought about the change? Yeah, Calvary. The finished work of Calvary changed history, eternity, forever. He said God overlooked people's former ignorance about these things, but now because of Jesus... He commands everyone everywhere to turn away from idols or, and even if that idol is yourself, amen, and to turn to him. Verse 31, for he has set a day for judging the world with justice by the man he has appointed, and he proved to everyone who this is by raising him from the dead. Someone asked me um, who, who in this meeting, who I listened to. And, I, and, you know, for news right now, I never actually got around to answering the question. But in the back of my mind, what I would have said was Joe Rogan. <laughs> I know, I'm weird. I like to say that regularly. But if you listen to Joe Rogan talk about the clash of ideas, the interesting thing about him is he's pretty much unbiased. He's kind of learning on the fly, albeit while he smokes weed. But anyways, on the podcast. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an interesting insight to a person who genuinely, like, and you chuckle at that, but I think of Acts 17. You know, Joe Rogan is one of the philosophers of our day. He has the largest podcast audience of anybody. He talks in depth about the clash of ideas. He brings people on who are smarter than, than him and asks him ideas. So it's not crazy to say you listen to that because it's a clash of ideas. You're trying to understand how does the world think? How do unbelievers think? And, and in one of the, the clips that I saw of him, he basically was bashing Christianity because he was saying there's no possible way you can make sense of what the gospel proclaims. Now, he didn't say gospel. He said Christianity. That God would murder his own son and that that would be a sacrifice and atonement of our sins. He's like, you can't prove that. And I thought, exactly. This is good. Because now we're getting down to brass tacks. Because the world wants something that makes sense. But the Bible says what? We walk by faith, not sight. And what I would have gone back to Joe Rogan with, if I would have been in the studio with him, is, great, tell me your solution for death. Who has the vaccine for death? 
Because no matter what you believe about the world, we can all 110% agree death is not normal. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you believe. You understand when you lose someone close to you, this is not the way that it is supposed to be. I am not supposed to be disconnected from loved ones. I am not supposed to be disconnected from close friends. This is not normal. And as of yet, the world and humanistic thinking and science has no remedy for death. So that's great if you think Christianity is a joke, but tell me how you make sense of the world without it. Because the crux of what Jesus came to do was to destroy death. Amen. Are you here today? The Bible says that because of what Christ did, he holds the keys to hell, death, and the grave. That's the crux of the gospel. That's the crux of Christianity. And so, I applaud people, I I appreciate people's skepticism. But when I'm trying to make sense of my earthly, human, sometimes miserable experience, what happens to me is there has to be more than this. And isn't it interesting that even non-believers tend to say that? I don't know what happens to me when I die, but there has to be an afterlife. Why is that? Well, could it be that what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, that the Lord has put eternity in all of our hearts? That we look at the brokenness of our world, we look at the pain and the sorrow and the suffering, and we go, this is miserable. And God goes, I know. That's why I didn't leave you to yourself. And when you start to think that way, I mean, imagine being alive before Jesus and you didn't have that hope or that confidence. Imagine the longing and the looking because the prophets foretold it. The prophet said it was coming. The Messiah was coming. And you looked at the brokenness and the pain and the hurting of the world and you looked around and you saw, we need a Messiah. But you didn't have the assurance that we have now, verse 30, in this time. Boy, we are blessed. We have this incredible promise. The more that I study this, the more I think every Sunday should be Easter Sunday. Amen. This is all that matters. There is nothing else. The hope of eternity is Jesus. The hope of salvation is Jesus. The hope for our sins is Jesus. There is no plan B. That's it. And yet, we see people reject it because they love their life. Their frail, short, not guaranteed tomorrow life. More than the truth. I don't know about you, but it's a sad thing to me that Eddie Van Halen died. I loved Van Halen. And I remember listening to him. I remember going to concerts. I don't think I ever went to a Van Halen concert, but I remember being in the moment and thinking, wow, a rock god, literally. That could not lose. He was on top of the world, gone like that. Here today, gone tomorrow. The only way that you and I can make sense of the world is in this book. And I'll tell you again, I've said it before, this is how we have to view what's happening in our world, through the lens of Scripture, because there is hope for us. Well, I actually found my notes and brought them and hardly used them today, so (laughs) we'll hit on this again. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. I pray, Lord, that in this season, 
that we find ourselves in in history, that we would just have an increasing love and passion. We didn't even get to the Bereans in Acts 17 and 18 who searched, the Bible says they searched the scriptures daily to see if what you said was true. God, I pray that in this season you would help us to have that same passion to search the scriptures daily to see if what, what I say or anyone else from this pulpit says is true. And if it is, Lord, help us to respond to the leading, the guiding, and the nudging of the Holy Spirit and to realign our lives with your truth. We love you this morning. We praise you because your word is true and it will not return void. We thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen.